With us today is General James J. Lindsay, former commander at Fort Bragg of the 82nd Airborne Division of 18th Airborne Corps and the U.S. Special Operations Command. We are here today in front of the Vietnam exhibit at the Airborne and Special Operations Museum, which is particularly fitting because General Lindsay is a Vietnam veteran. So welcome, General Lindsay, and Thank you. thanks for being here today. Thank you. I'm honored. So one of the things that prompted our talk with General Lindsay today is that he was recently honored on Veterans Day weekend with the first inaugural Hometown Hero Award. It's an award that's presented by the City of Fayetteville, by the Cool Spring Downtown District, by the Cumberland County Veterans Council, and by the Airborne and Special Operations Museum. For that person who has contributed to significantly to the nature and development of the relationship between Fayetteville and the City of Fort, or Fort Bragg itself. So thank you, sir. And really what I wanted to ask you is, what does this award mean to you, which we've got sitting here in front of well, us? Well, it's obviously very meaningful, but I would tell you, there are a bunch of hometown heroes involved in making this museum a reality. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history, and you'll see as I talk about it, there are a bunch of hometown heroes. I was one of several. We just happened to capture you today, yes, which is fantastic. Right. So yeah. we really appreciate you being here for that. So. As we start through this process, and it was great sitting there to listen to you being presented with this award, I didn't know this, that actually for, the ASOM was supposed to be out at Fort Bragg. That's correct. Let me give you the history of the thing. It all started in 1982. I was commanding the 82nd Airborne Division and uh, went to a briefing at 18th Corps Post Headquarters. And one of the things they mentioned in the briefing was they had a plan to tear down all the World War II buildings. And uh, these were buildings built in 39, 1939, 1940, and 1941, hundreds of thousands of them across the states. And uh, they were built to last 20 years. At that point, they were over 40 years old. So as I was driving back to division headquarters, uh, I got to thinking about, you know, that was an engineering marvel that they didn't putting all those things together. So I thought it'd be really great if we could preserve some of them. And I happened to be walking, driving by the 82nd Museum building very small building, as you probably know. And I got to thinking, if we could get four of those buildings, a chapel, a barracks, a mess hall, and a supply room orderly, and put them next to the museum, we could put artifacts in them. So I started working on that, and uh, I worked for about two years trying to get federal money to preserve these buildings, and failed. I left Bragg, went down to Fort Benning, and then came back to command 18th Airborne Corps. And I was still interested in it, even though I was the Corps, not the division commander. So uh, I checked with my engineers, and there was no possibility of getting federal money. So I then said, well, look, I'm going to go see the Chamber of Commerce and see if they can help me. And Fritz Healy, uh, Healy Wholesale, was then uh, chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. And I went to see him, and I made my pitch for money to preserve these buildings. And uh, he responded by saying, Look, last month the Green Berets were here looking for money. This month it's the Red Berets. Why don't you guys get together and build a museum that the chamber and the whole community can get behind and support? And I got to, I thought, that's probably a pretty good idea. So I went back to Fort Bragg, and at that time Special Forces at Bragg was a very small organization compared to what it is today. It was called the Special Warfare Center, and it was commanded by Brigadier General Joe Lutz. And I went and saw General Lutz, told him what Fritz Healy had advised me of, and he said he agreed with it. So I went back and got the staff at CORE, and uh, we found a 20-acre site on which we'd put the museum in the four World War II buildings we wanted to save. We could raise the money to do it. Uh, we established the site. We did some grading on it and so forth. And I left in 86. And um, really nothing happened from 86 to 90, but there were four organizations working on this. First, the Chamber of Commerce, the uh, City of Fayetteville, Cumberland County, and we'd formed an Airborne Special Operations Museum Foundation, Foundation in the summer of 1990. From 86 to 90, basically nothing happened at Bragg, but the organization that really kept this dream alive was the Chamber of Commerce. They really worked on it. In the summer I retired in 1990, Lindo Tippett, who was chairman of the chamber at that time, contacted me and said they'd hired a local lawyer to draw up the paperwork to form a 501c3 foundation to build the museum. 501c3 foundations, you could deduct your distribution, your donation on your taxes. So um, he said, we're working on it and we should have it together in the next month or so. And then he said, would you be willing to head the organization? And I said, I'd be honored to do that. And 
We had our first meeting in uh, August of uh, 1990 at the Officers Club at Fort Bragg. We uh, then got together and tried to decide just how we were going to approach this. And we decided first we'd go after federal money, state money, and then get into a fund drive. The problem was we didn't have any money to spend on note raising money. And we were blessed by two gentlemen uh, who are real hometown heroes, Fritz Healy, whose idea it was to start this whole thing, and Healy Wholesale, and John Koenig of Koenig Realty. They each donated $50,000, and that got us off the ground. We hired a fundraising firm, and I spent a lot of the next two years in Washington working with a number of congressmen, primarily Terry San Senator Terry Sanford. And he got us a $4 million federal grant. At, on the local level, State Senator Tony Rand got us a $4 million state grant. And at the same time, former Fayetteville Mayor Charlie Holt was conducted a fundraising drive, and he raised $2 million. And this time, about 1994, I would say, something like that. And uh, we had about $10 million. And we'd hired a design firm, to an architect, to design the building and everything. And uh, so in uh, 1996, we broke grand ground on the 20-acre site at Bragg, which we set aside to build a museum on and preserved, put the preserved World War II buildings. Um, we broke ground in, that in, 19, in September 1996. Uh, unfortunately, there was a protest by one of the con contractors bidding on the process, and he protested, and as a result, we couldn't open the bids and we, at the time we broke ground. And um, when we opened them, we went into a state of shock. We'd anticipated that the museum would cost about $8 million for the building, $4 million for the stuff things and artifacts and everything that were inside. Well, when we opened the bids, the low bid for the building alone was over $16 million, which was, you know, incredible. And we didn't know quite what we were going to do. We started trying to raise more money, but without much success. And we struggled for almost a year. And in uh, the fall of 1997, Labor Day 1997, uh, David Jameson, who was head of the Fayetteville Chamber of Commerce, contacted me and said he spoke for the city, the county, and the chamber. If we would uh, move the museum site downtown Fayetteville, they would pick up the difference. It was probably four or five, six million dollars. And they agreed to do that. And so I, we had a board meeting after that and uh, discussed it. And we said, we'll move. And so we moved downtown. We initially looked at a site in what is now Festival Park, where the old USO building would be on Ray Avenue. Uh, there were some coal gasification plant there in the 1930s, and we were a little worried about what that would do to the construction of the project. So Dale Dawkins, then mayor, worked with us, and we ended up moving to the 500 block of Hay Street, the infamous 500 block of Hay Street, biggest house of ill repute in North Carolina. And here, this site that had been dedicated to separating soldiers from their money and paratroopers and special forces soldiers was now going to honor them. And it was just a, literally a miracle what the city and the county did. They bought and tore down the whole several block area, the, the 500 block and east of it, and tore them all down, moved them to the county landfill, and that's the site we're on right now. And uh, just a miracle what they did. If you look at the building now, uh, it's just astonishing what, what, what we did, so to speak. But uh, we had one problem after we opened the, the bids. We realized that uh, we were going to have to take out a lot of glass and steel. And the building was originally eight stories high. We took out three stories down to five stories. And the archway that leads into the museum used to extend all the way out over the Iron Mike statue. It, we told, it would have been great if we could have built a museum that looked like that, but we simply didn't have the money to do it. And we went to work and opened the museum in the summer of 1990, National Airborne Day. Well, what an amazing story about how something that started on Fort Bragg came down yeah. town and, and all the millions of visitors that come here every year. I mean, it's amazing what that's done for our downtown area. Yeah, and thank goodness we moved downtown because given security situation, situation now, we wouldn't have had near the number of visitors on Fort Bragg that we have here. Sure, that's a great point. Yeah. And I understand, too, Ross Perot was a big assistance in this yes, process. Yes, I 
It was very interesting. I'd, uh, I had all my friends who knew Perot working with me on it, and we worked and worked, and uh, I guess three or four years probably, maybe three years, and, um, and I, we didn't get anything. And Ross Perot was here at a Special Forces Association function, and uh, a German paratrooper, German Fallschirmjäger, came up to talk to us, and he talked about uh, Horst Ludwig, and uh, Pro wanted to know what this is all about. And back when I had the 82nd, I felt we needed a parachute that we could jump much lower, be much safer to avoid anti-aircraft fire. And the Germans had a triple canopy parachute that you could jump from 300 feet. And so I went to Germany and jumped it and looked like a good thing. So I had a, on the 13th, the Friday the 13th of uh, December in uh, 1983, we had an airborne conference here, and Horst Ludwig and I jumped the parachute to demonstrate what it could do. And unfortunately, I got my, I, we jumped from 300 feet. I got my act together. I was leveled with the lights in a softball field. He unfortunately was killed. Holy cow! And uh, and this German paratrooper was talking about him, and I explained all this to Perot, and uh, he was sitting at a different table than I was in this special forces function and midway through the dinner he got up from the table came over and said you you got your million dollars for the museum which was very good he funded the theater and the uh, simulator wow that's fantastic yeah holy cow yeah it's amazing as I sat through some of these meetings with you all over the last year to learn how important these contributions are for the museum from from outside donations yeah and you know we're faced with a real challenge now because um, the exhibits we have here are 80s and 90s technology, and uh, we don't have any an inch more, square inch more of exhibit space. So we've got to find a way to recognize the special forces and airborne soldiers who fought in the war on terror over the last 17 years. Sure. And uh, we don't the current technology we can't do anything. So we talked with the Center for Military History, the Army organization that's in charge of all installation museums, and. Uh, they told us that if we had current technology such as you see in the National Football League Hall of Fame or uh, the World War II Museum in New Orleans, we could expand our exhibit space by 50 to 60 percent. Wow. And they went on to say that the cost of doing the design work would be about a million dollars. And the Center for Military History will spend a million dollars to get that design if we can raise eight and a half million dollars to build the exhibits. And we're very fortunate in two real genuine hometown heroes who are hitting our fund drive to raise that money. Uh, Ralph Huff, the developed real estate developer, and Bobby Bleeker in the automobile business. And they started a few months ago and they've already raised $2 million. Oh, and fantastic. so anybody watching this, we, we really need your money to get this new exhibit in in place because we'd be able to honor the soldiers that we can't do anything for now. Sure, and that's a great point, and we'll put information out to folks yeah. about where they can go find yeah. places to donate. But again, mm -hmm. it's real important to, to know that, that this place is funded by, by donations yeah. from, from private folks out there who are just uh, willing to help uh, pay honor to our soldiers for, for what they exactly. do. Um, it, also interesting, for us from the city side, and so I see all these great things going on, and I did a lot of reading on, on you and your career beforehand and all the great things that you did. And so you land here in Fayetteville, you do all these great things, you chose to retire here, which I'll ask you about in a little while, but to think what you started and what the crew starting the ASOM started down here. I mean, as I it did- It wasn't just me, it was the no, whole No, not team. just you, I understand that, and, and good point, but what the ASOM really represents. And so, as I think about what sits 300 meters behind us, which is a $38 million baseball stadium, and a $65 million public-private partnership with the renovation of our old 1925 yeah. Prince Charles building and a new hotel, uh, and then back up to what is here now with the ASOM. This really was the catalyst way back then for starting what happened is happening it now. It played a role, no doubt. Absolutely, and, and so that to me is very exciting as, as from the city side, uh, because I don't think we'd be here today with that now, without what you and your crew have started here with the ASOM. And I think that's a very that's special very thing. That's very kind of you. So uh, it really means a lot from the city side mm -hmm. for what you have instituted. I mean, look across, and I still remember, as I was reading some of the history behind here and what's moved down here, we had the moving of the Iron Mike in 2010. That's correct. And I yeah. still remember that day when I was with the Corps and we ran that down. I think Frank, General Helmick, I think, led that, that run 
where yeah. we ran from from the Iron Mike existing on Fort Bragg down here yeah. Yeah. and and had a right. whole bunch of troops running formation but we yeah. brought it and then the next year in 2011 uh, we actually uh, opened the North Carolina Veterans Park yeah, which that, is that right was next an interesting year. story um, Tony Rand contacted me uh, and I can't remember the date now but he contacted me about the state veterans park and uh, the city manager uh, Tony Schiavone was the mayor at the time but the city manager and I made a pitch to the several key legislatures that Tony Rand had lined up in Raleigh and we got a 15 million dollar grant to build or the, the city got a 15 million dollar grant to build the North Carolina State Veterans Park and it's only half done they have to wait till they tore down tear down the rest of the Roy and Street Bridge right to put the expand the park the way it's supposed to be and interestingly uh, the, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin originally, and one of the firms, one of the two engineering firms, did the design work on it. And I worked with one of them from Madison, Wisconsin, and I have told them the story of the World War II buildings. So in phase two of that thing, which should open in the next two years, they're going to have a chapel, a barracks, and a mess hall. And Bragg has designated the buildings, and they're available to move whenever we... We wanted to move them when we moved down here originally, but we didn't have the money to do right. it. Right, and I was going to ask you about that, because I remember, too, and you mentioned back at Benning, which if you go down there now at Fort Benning in Columbus, Georgia, they've got that same setup at their That's museum, right. they've where got they've got buildings. all the buildings That's down correct. there, which is an incredible thing to see, that you can actually walk into that history. Yeah. Exactly. And I remember, to your point, too, when we first got here, when I was first stationed here in 2010, uh, up on the on the back side of post there, there were hundreds of those buildings still in yes. existence, and I think most of them are gone now. There still are a few. It's 75 yeah. years old. Yeah. But it's amazing, you know, I, I first came here in 1953, and compare what you see down here now and what we're going to see in the near future to what this Fayetteville was like in 1953. It's two different worlds. Completely. Oh, it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. My dad was That's first. great leadership on part of Fayetteville. Oh, it is. And it is. Cumberland County. Yeah. and the Chamber of Commerce, all three work together to make this great situation. Well, happen. and that's, that's a great point, and really that partnership is what it's all about, yeah. and, and making sure that uh, things come together to make yeah. stuff work. But, but to your point on the development, I was looking at pictures. My dad was stationed here in his first assignment uh, from 59 to 62, and so mm -hmm. I looked at all of his old photographs of on base, and a lot of it included those World War II barracks up on Smoke Bomb Hill. Yeah, that's I right. came back here in 95 for, for Jump Master School, and I was trying to compare them in the 50s, 60s to, to 95, and you saw that change, saw the things downtown and what's changed, and then jumped to, to today in 2018. And it's amazing how this place has transformed, and it really is. And again, it goes back to here and the ASOM and how much I think that has played a part in moving Fayetteville forward. Yeah. Um, and, and really excited, too, about North Carolina Veterans Park. That's something from our side that we do want to talk about with the public at some point uh, and share those plans because that's going to be a great addition to ASOM, yeah. the Veterans Park, and then And then all the two. other things going up with the stadium and the new building that's going to the parking garage and the hotel and everything. Sure. Oh, it's awesome. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. I can't wait well, to see that, especially when the stadium opens here just in April, which is only a few months away. But that's what I said. There are a bunch of hometown heroes in Fayetteville that made that happen. Right not just me. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate what you've done and, and the rest of those folks around you to make that happen. One of the things, too, you talk about the relationship uh, with folks around here, with different organizations to make this happen. Um, what made you choose to retire here once you stayed? Was, was well, it that relationship I, and what you had already ongoing? I'd spent 16 of my 38 years in the Army at Fort Bragg, so I liked Fayetteville very much. And we were, in fact, when I was commanding the Corps, we were looking around for either a lot or a house to buy for, for when I retired. And um, we were still looking when the, some folks in JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command, organized a triathlon at what is now Wood Lake, the lake up there, and now Wood Swamp, actually. <laughs> but uh, they organized a triathlon on the road. There was a, not an Iron Man, it was a, mile swim, 27 mile bikes, and six mile run. On the six mile run, I saw a house for sale, or a lot, not a house, a lot. And uh, we bid on it and got it, and that's when we, we were going to move here to Fayetteville, but we decided we'd move to Wood Lake, and we've been there for 28 years. Wow, 
Well, it's amazing because there's hundreds, well, thousands, almost, I think over 100,000 folks who have retired in this area. And so whether oh, yeah. it's in Fayetteville or in the surrounding area, That's but again, exactly it right. goes back to that community and, and the sense of, of pride, I think, and, and the sense of ownership and belonging that people yeah. have uh, from coming and serving here. So it really is special. And yeah. uh, it really means a lot, I think, to folks to, to see folks like you stay here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, before we move off into uh, other areas, I wanted to ask about your time in the Army and, and a couple simple questions. We've got you here, I, as I mentioned to you before the show, I think you're the, the most important person I've had the opportunity to interview, which means a lot to me, but I wanted to ask you as a retired general officer, what's one of the most important things you could share with a new young lieutenant, young private, first coming into the Army, based on what you've seen there, in your time? There are a whole bunch of things I could, but I think the single most important thing I tell any new soldier young is you need to know and fully understand the mission of your organization because everything you do has to be focused on accomplishing that mission and if you don't know and understand the mission you probably aren't going to be doing everything you can do to make that organization better that's the key thing i would share with them i think that's a very good piece of advice well i appreciate that and what about from the family side Families to me is kind of what makes that soldier work well, if, assuming that they've got a, a family here with them. Well, I, I, you know, and this is true throughout, military families are deeply involved in everything going on in Fayetteville. And there are so many of them here and so many have retired here that uh, the interface between the community and the, the civilian community and the military community here is absolutely fantastic. And so, right. From that perspective, is there any piece of advice or wisdom you could give a, a young family coming in here in terms of getting involved, I just staying say, involved? Yeah, that's it. Involve yourself in the local community because we are one community. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's really, from, from the ASOM perspective, all I want to ask, is there any other things you'd like to share with us from the things you've seen and done around here in Fayetteville uh, that might be of importance no, for I, viewers I today? No, I think... What's happened in Fayetteville since 1953, when I first came here, is an absolute miracle. And it's directly attributable to great leadership. You go back to Bill Hurley, uh, Jail Talbert, uh, Tony Schiavone, there's just a series of great leaders that have made this happen, both in the county and the city side. Just a super community. Well, I think that's a great point. I mean, you mentioned some other ones like Ralph Huff and, and Mr. Bleeker Absolutely. and others that are, that are still involved. And, yeah. and again, from sitting in the, the meetings with you all from the mm -hmm. board of directors side for the ASOM, I, interesting for me to see that because they all have a great sense of uh, caring and belonging for this community and what it means to keep moving the ASOM forward, but the rest of the city as well. And, and they've yeah. got a, a deep-seated interest in that. What Ralph and Bobby have done is just amazing. I say they're off to a great start. They've already raised $2 million, and we're going for a lot more. Right. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me okay. today to talk about the ASOM. Very thankful for what you have done, and I, and I get your point that it's been a team effort. But again, we've got really your face here. We've got okay. this great award. Yeah. So honored that you could be our first recipient. As I talked with former Mayor Shivani before I came to speak with you, uh, he had so many good Tony things to Shivani say. Tony Shivani is a genuine hometown hero. He is. He's awesome. He's fantastic. Yeah. And so he, he goes back and, and, of course, credits you with being that great visionary leader that's helped move things forward here. So we thank you for your efforts, for all the things you've done. Uh, of course, thank the ASOM for letting us be in here today. And again, very touching from the Vietnam exhibit side being behind us here. Yeah. They actually had uh, talks before that said that this mannequin here is supposed to be a replica or represent you, oh, I uh, didn't which know I that. thought Nobody was very interesting. That. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that was kind of a surprise as we were going through here to say that that really is representative of what you've done. But your service over 38 years from the military, much appreciated. And again, all of the things you continue to do because it's great folks like you that really allow this city to move forward. Thank you, that's so, a great time, David. So thank you, sir, for being thank here you. today.